it seemed to me from flitting around to the three sessions that they were constructive, and I hope uh, we'll find out if that was so. And the plan now is that I'm going to ask each of the moderators uh, to spend a few minutes talking about uh, what they did and how it came out. And then we'll see at the end if there's uh, some conclusions we can draw. But as I said at the beginning, this is not intended to be a one-off thing where we solve all the problems. Uh, it's intended to be a start. Uh, and I've told the moderators, you know, they didn't have to force consensus. It's perfectly fine to say people didn't agree. Well, if they did, that's fine too. But this is all work, uh, along with other issues. We could only do three today. But, and one person pointed out to me very clearly at the earlier break that uh, there's a number of things we're not talking about that we should be talking about. Uh, and he's quite right about that. But uh, we can only do so many at a time. And so stay tuned for uh, when we turn our attention to other things. But I'm going to start over here with Scott Miller. We're going to work our way across. So what did you guys do? You were the three zeros. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> my, my breakout session, we're talking about the three zeros as a policy goal. We had a, a very uh, a lively conversation. And uh, first, uh, thanks and, and, and full measure of the success of the panel was due to the great discussions, uh, Dan Atkinson of the Cato Institute, uh, with, with the classic defense of free markets as you'd expect from, uh, from the Cato uh, Institute and, and, and a, a great way to set sort of what's in it for the public, what's in it for the consumer uh, to actually get to the three zeros. And Ambassador Susan Schwab, uh, ever the realist, uh, but someone who is also committed to, deeply committed to open markets, but has, still bears the scars of her time as, 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 uh, as a trade negotiator and uh, with a clear eye toward the, the, the difficulty of actually achieving this. So we had a great conversation. Uh, the highlights were this. First, I think we, we all agreed, and the people who, interact, who were, were participating with us in the room agreed, the big goals can have, in political uh, terms, can have value. Uh, the, one of the examples we pointed to that, that is a pretty good one was uh, the APEC BOGOR goals. These were set in 1994. Uh, it was a very general goal of free, op free and open trade and investment in the APEC region among the 21 economies. Uh, they set a very <coughs> long timetable. It was 1994, so the, uh, the advanced economies were supposed to achieve this goal by 2010 or 15 years into the future, developing economies by 2020 or 25 years into the future. Now, we're almost to 2020, so you can tell how old these goals are. And while <clears throat> every discussion of goals about, about the zeros, uh, I, I conjure up sort of uh, my, when I, when I uh, was in uh, high school math memorizing the quadratic equations, and I keep seeing that curve that is, I think the math teacher would call it asymptotic at zero, that it, it, it tapers down, but ne it never quite gets to zero. So uh, perfection is maybe not possible, but in the case of the APEC region, well, everybody always jokes about how APEC gets together and has meetings and nothing ever happens. If you look every single year, if you look at the total amount of trade which crossed borders at zero tariffs, it increased every single year. So there was a, time, there was a point in time, thanks to the Bogar goals, where the safest bet in international economics was that East Asia was going to integrate. And so, th so these kinds of things can work. They don't always work, but they can. So that was the, that was the first point of discussion. Second, uh, that, uh, thanks to, uh, to Susan's intervention, is we talked about the difficulty of this, practical difficulties for the Trump administration. Keep in mind, President Trump has chosen bilateral negotiations with Europe, with Japan, and, and uh, at some point, perhaps, the United Kingdom as his priorities. Okay, now, a, a, those three uh, economies, along with the United States, have a, have a characteristic at this point which is really the consequence of 50 years of tariff reduction uh, thanks to the GATT, okay? What we have in common is <coughs> there are a lot of tariffs that are zero. In, in the case of the United States, 40% of trade, MFN trade, occurs at zero tariffs. So think electronics, aviation, uh, transport equipment are already at zero. So, so a lot of trade is, is already at zero, MFN. And that our average trade, you know, the U.S. average trade-weighted tariff uh, is 1.7%. Just look up the federal budget. 
Total tariff collections last year were about $35 billion on $2 trillion worth of imports. So tariffs are very low already in the United States. We're almost to the first zero, except for all the things that aren't. Okay, and it's the, it's the things that have survived liberalization for 50 years that are still stubborn, that are still politically sensitive and politically difficult. Uh, uh, we, the Jones Act was, was, uh, was mentioned as an example of this. There are things that in the U.S. tariff schedule that are, for whatever reason, off limits. And so, uh, so that is a practical, that's the practical circumstance of each of our, new, our counterparties. Europe has the same kinds of problems, particularly in agriculture. Japan has the same kind of problems, I think rice. So, uh, so it's the, it, getting all the way to zero is tough. Uh, second, and this is, uh, Ambassador Schwab made the great intervention here, which is that <clears throat> at this point, the non-tariff side is the hardest part. And uh, that, that making an effort, one of the practical things we, that, we, that we might consider doing as a country is moving it on a pro on a, as a project to tariffize the non-tariff barriers, to quantify them and make them, a, make them like a tariff so we know what, what the cost of the, of the, of the non-tariff barrier is and then you're better able to trade off, make the trade-offs to reduce it. But non-tariff barriers are a substantial problem. With these negotiating partners, frankly, industrial subsidies are already at zero or they're heavily disciplined. Uh, so, so that's not as big an issue. But uh, the Trump administration, to apply the three zeros to these three partners, the EU, <coughs> Japan, and eventually the United Kingdom, will have its challenges in the same way the U.S. will have its challenges getting to zero on our hard things. So the third point uh, that, that we discussed was that uh, it is possible to find the success of the three zeros if you look within markets. And uh, we, thanks to an audience question, we mentioned that the information technology agreement, 90% of global trade in electronics happens at zero tariffs. It's not yet zero subsidies, thanks to uh, partners like China who are part of that, that trading uh, uh, ecosystem, but it's zero tariffs and, and for the most part, zero non-tariff barriers. That's why your phone's so cheap. But in addition, if you look, stop looking at international trade and just look at normal commerce, because thanks to Dan Eikenson, we know commerce is commerce, whether the parties are domestic or international. Uh, that within the United States, thanks to the Commerce Clause, and now within <coughs> the European member states, thanks to the EU single market, you have very large consumer markets, which have achieved the three zeros, and no support, you know, no, by no accident, these are some of the most prosperous, dynamic markets in the world, where people you know, people's lives get better because of them. So we, at the end of the day, we concluded this is hard, it's worth doing. Finally, we thought it was a, a change for, for the, a turn for the, uh, the Trump administration because the three zeros is a vote of confidence. It's a statement of confidence, okay? Right now, we have statements from the administration on unfairness of the trading system, that somehow Americans have been cheated. The three zeros says, we have a great market here. It's open, it's dynamic, and you're welcome to participate in it. You're treated fairly. Uh, you, you, you have the, every right to contest this market. It's transparent and open. What we'd like in return is the chance for our firms and our in businesses to contest your markets in the same way. And it's a statement of American confidence. And uh, so that may be the reason, if no other, to pursue it. Let me stop there. Okay, Matt, talk to us about institutions. Okay, well, I have a, that's a tough act to follow. Um, we, we had a more abstract um, uh, task than, than I think um, either Zero or China, because uh, we were doing out with the old, in with the new. Um, we had terrific, uh, and, and, and I think quite uh, different, as you would expect, presentations from Derek Scissors of um, AEI, um, who's always, uh, he's not here so I can say, you know, I don't think he'd mind, uh, you know, a bit of a bomb thrower, uh, so he, um, he, uh, he gave a very provocative presentation, and then Kathy Novelli gave a, a, a sensible uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, alternative, alternative perspective. Uh, to that. I'd, say, I'd say just to quickly, I mean, I think Derek, if you'd summarize what Derek said, he basically said, and I think this is a quote, don't blow up the WTO, but ignore it. He, he thinks, you know, we should ignore it. And, and I'll explain a little bit more of that in a second. Second was, the U.S. needs to start by deciding what its own, um, direction is, what its own direction is on trade, uh, its own direction on intellectual property, um, on investment screening. And he cited the fact that we moved ahead and did FIRMA 
uh, this new um, CFIUS uh, legislation, and other countries are now emulating us. And that's where we should start, is fi figuring out our own. And we don't have a consensus internally on many of those issues, and we need to figure that out before we figure out what to do with the WTO or anything else. Um, so that was, I think, another core point Derek was trying to make. And then, you know, he, ma he also made a sort of broader point that the WTO is not uh, really the the main shaper or driver of globalization. It's really the role of the U.S. as the responsible steward of the dollar-based um, system. And as long as we continue to run current account deficits and provide dollars to the world, then uh, we're doing our job, and that's the most important thing uh, for the global system, not the WTO or, or trade rules or anything else. That's Derek's you know, perspective based on what he's really focused and interested on. Kathy, she's here, so I'm, I'm loath to summarize everything she said, but she basically said, you know, before the system there was chaos, without this, a system there would be chaos again. Um, the, acknowledging though the WTO can't solve everything, but it's been useful, you know, to lower tariffs, to provide stability, transparency, basic rules. Um, uh, acknowledging some of the particular challenges like the consensus-based approach is, is a challenge, and so you need to have plurilaterals and sectorals and other approaches to help overcome that. Um, need to focus on new areas like services and digital. Um, the dispute settlement mechanism needs to move faster. Um, made an interesting point about integrating WTO work with the work in other areas on uh, environmental related issues, um, wildlife trafficking and, and other issues, um, and that needs to do better at that. And then importantly, and it's um, consistent with her nonprofit and the work that she does, we need to, the WTO needs to do a better job, and we all need to do a better job of explaining trade uh, to ordinary people, and she does listening tours of, um, you know, to hear what ordinary Americans think, and, uh, and I think that uh, was an important uh, insight that the WTO ought to do more of that. Um, we, 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 did, we didn't have clickers as we sometimes do here at CSS, but we did poll the audience on three questions. Um, one, uh, you know, is, from a U.S. interest perspective, is it worth salvaging the WTO or should we throw it out and start with something new? That's the sort of threshold question here. I'd say 90-10, uh, there was support for trying to salvage uh, what we have in the WTO, maybe not surprising, uh, but there was as much as 10% thinking, you know, we should throw it out and start over. Uh, another question was, who's most to blame, the US or China, for the problems in the WTO system? Um, I think we saw four hands saying the US was to blame. Uh, the rest of the hands that went up were China, uh, but there were a bunch of people who didn't vote, and I'm guessing those were Europeans who didn't want to offend uh, either side. Um, either that or they wanted to vote for India. Uh, or they wanted to vote for India. That's right. We didn't offer India. Um, and, then, uh, and then, you know, I asked, you know, do people think that the fundamental deal, the kind of basic premise of the WTO system of, you know, we'll give up a little bit of sovereignty if you give up a little bit of sovereignty, and we all got our hands tied a little bit, and we all sort of net benefit, all boats rise, I'm mixing metaphors, but um, is that sort of fundamental deal still a good thing for the U.S., or is it a raw deal, as others have said? And I would say overwhelming, including Derek, uh, there was support for the notion that the basic premise of, of, of that deal still makes sense for the United States, which was interesting. Yeah, rules are better than power. Right. Um, the audience offered some interesting things, and it's really hard to summarize because there's so many good, smart ideas. So I apologize to the audience who was in our room if they didn't, uh, if we didn't capture everything. But I'd say, I think the, there was a basic view in the room, which is maybe not surprising in this town, that the WTO is no longer the forum for setting the rules, for arbitrating the rules, um, and so forth. It's it's more of a floor. Or it had this, you know, I think good concept that the WTO is really a floor and you need to supplement it with other things now. You need to have plurilaterals or bilaterals or sectorals or other things. Mm -hmm. I think that was a sort of a general uh, view in the room. Um, secondly, the, a, a sense that it's, it's not just about the forum. It, in fact, it's not maybe primarily about the forum. It's about the players. And so we would be having issues with China and India and others with or, with or without a WTO. We have to uh, deal with those um, somewhere. Uh, so that should be the sort of focus of thinking. Uh, there was an interesting point made about the, the kind of soft power of the WTO that for emerging countries and lower, less developed countries, you know, the attraction the the, of joining the WTO and the incentives created for better governance and for uh, more capacity and so forth was something the WTO does bring to the table and that was an important thing that is sort of part of the baby that you don't want to throw out with the bathwater. Um, and again, more broadly, I'd say people uh, felt that, uh, you know, the baby is still useful. 
um, things like MFN and national treatment, although those were not explicitly talked about, but the sort of sense of the room was those things are still useful. You don't want to throw those things out. But uh, that the WTO is not well suited to the new issues, to you know, digital issues, um, IPs, to SOEs, um, <coughs> investments, services, and so forth. And that's the real problem. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another point uh, that was made by, uh, maybe implicitly by a couple of people, was that the WTO is really not equipped for the new bleeding of national security issues into economic and trade issues, and so that was a sort of a, a bit of a theme um, that, that was uh, raised. Um, and maybe relatedly, somebody raised the question of whether it's worth uh, the U.S. supporting institutions uh, that bind us in an era of strategic competition. And so that was sort of put out as a question. Um, if we're in an era of strategic competition, do we want to be as bound? Although, as I say, I go back to the overall audience response to the notion that the deal still, still works for us. Um, China was, of course, talked about explicitly, implicitly throughout. Um, no big um, uh, conclusion that, other than the ones that I've touched on. Um, I'll leave that to Scott. Um, and then, obviously, as, as Bill said, there were a lot of things we didn't talk about in great depth, just because there wasn't enough time. You needed to give us another two or three hours, Bill. Uh, but we didn't, so we didn't talk much about the dispute <coughs> settlement mechanism or other things. But, um, but that captures, I think, most of what we were talking about. So with that. Okay. Well, if ben, all I can say is the WTO is a baby. It's the oldest baby in the world. You know, it's, <laughs> but uh, anyway, Scott. Sure. Um, <coughs> Usually when I talk about China, I, I, I feel like Tom Hanks who just crashed on a deserted island and uh, got lots volleyball. of problems. Uh, and, but, uh, but today I feel like I found Wilson and we were having a real conversation <laughs> and it was much more constructive than, than ever. Now maybe I was delusional uh, and this will soon pass. Uh, and I'll go back to feeling uh, my, my usual pessimistic self. But I think we had some const constructive conversations uh, and some, uh, not total agreement, but we kind of know where the, the lines are drawn. Um, I think that we had to give credit to David Dollar and, and Ambassador Guajardo for, for doing fantastic jobs of laying out the uh, alternative positions of, of uh, the benefits of engagement and also some of the, the downsides. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for the, the group that we had with us, which uh, offered uh, excellent proposals and suggestions, it was really an excellent uh, effort, collective effort. And I have three points that I think uh, summarize where uh, we, we come down or where the differences are, and then one final point we didn't get to, uh, but brings us back to the, the comments that Hank Paulson made at, at the beginning this morning. Uh, the first is, is on the, the question of does, what are the economic benefits or the balance sheet of engagement with China? And I think uh, David was uh, really f uh, strongly felt that, not, that on balance, the, the relationship benefits America tremendously across the board. Not everybody, it's unevenly felt, but that by and large, uh, it's still a good deal for the United States. Uh, China is not eating our lunch. Uh, and the trade balance is not a reflection of winning and losing. Um, I, uh, Jorge didn't directly speak to this. Uh, I offered the possibility that there might be other issues uh, that aren't reflected in the trade balance where uh, we, we could be doing much better with regard to market access uh, for investment in China or even exports, uh, the effect of Chinese state capitalism on intellectual property <coughs> rights, uh, on volatile markets created through you know, uh, volatility that occurs at again and again on a regular pace because of China's investment strategy, things like that. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think I, I was, we, we heard a, a very strong case for the fact that the relationship is still beneficial, that, it's, uh, that China isn't uh, eating our lunch. The, the, the second question has to do with the process of engagement. And there I think there was, a, 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 a big disagreement, uh, which is, uh, but maybe not, but not in the way that I expected. I, I thought uh, David defended uh, engagement, bilateral meetings, the multilateral process, regional agreements uh, as helpful and important, uh, but I think his bottom line was they're not great, but the consequences of walking away from those processes are really high. Not necessarily just vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with China, but vis-a-vis -vis the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, the counter argument uh, is, is that 
China is gaming the system. They'll talk you ear off forever. They will go through WTO cases for year after year after year, uh, and you will never get anywhere. You will be in the same place a decade from now, uh, but just spent time traveling uh, and, and using lawyers. And so the benefit of the tariffs uh, was a shock to the system, and we got the Chinese to the table and control the narrative about what the issues were and what needed to be done. Uh, I think from uh, Ambassador Guajardo's perspective, it looks like we may have lost that narrative and, and looks like we may be losing our nerve, so we might end up with not the kind of deal that we could have had we seen that through. So the second issue is about process. Uh, and I think it's probably the biggest area of disagreement um, the, the third area, uh, which was not a, a clear source of an argument, but was unresolved from the discussion, was uh, how do we break down the different parts of the relationship? If we're not going to just simply cut the Chinese off completely and have a full uh, economic divorce and disengagement, how do we structure the relationship? And there, I, I, I like to think of this in terms of traffic lights, uh, green lights that standard area of trade and investment that is obviously beneficial uh, and uh, where we can, where the bar barriers are relatively low, how much of that is the relationship that we can continue, uh, which is, gets to the zero uh, proposal. Mm -hmm. The second is the yellow, uh, and people brought up ideas of the yellow light, um, not with regard to trade, but with regard to investment. And uh, Ambassador Guajardo, uh, specifically brought forth the idea of, tr of investment reciprocity. And we discussed specific types of areas where it might occur, where currently the uh, Chinese uh, invest in the United States, where the U.S. doesn't have access to China's market. Uh, and I think actually both of, 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 of them, David and, and, and uh, Jorge, were okay with applying uh, reciprocity as a principle uh, in those kinds of instances. Uh, the question is actually how, do you, how would you implement that in a, in a careful way uh, according to a law and not just haphazardly do it. The last is the red light, uh, which is, you know, what do you, deal, what do you do with circumstances when trade and investment touch upon national security, um, governance issues, uh, uh, human rights, uh, corruption? Uh, what are the rules of the game? And I think the question, the broader question is where do we draw those lines? I think there was general agreement that those lines need to be drawn and they need to be drawn relatively clearly in, in, uh, uh, against the current idea that basically uh, these are malleable and fungible. Um, but there, I don't think uh, we resolved in the, two, in the hour that we had how to draw those, those lines between the green, yellow, and, and, re and red lights. Uh, final point, um, I, I think e we had more consensus and, co and a constructive conversation, I think partly because we, we left out one of the things that Hank Pawson brought up, brought up this morning, which is the strategic competition between the U.S. and China. Yeah. And uh, typically when you have a conversation in front of the lights uh, between two leaders or others, uh, you're talking about the national security concerns, the broader national security concerns, not just the specific military concerns, but about China's illiberal system versus the liberal international order and those bigger questions. So once you bring those to bear, then I think that probably puts more pressure on the types of conversations we have and whether we can get uh, a, not just consensus, <laughs> but a work plan for the problems that we need to address. And so, and I think that's to, partly, you know, we mostly deal with economic issues and today is primarily an, an economic conversation. And as you said, there's some things that we didn't get to today that we'll have to grapple with over time. One is how do you deal with the overlay of that overall competition uh, with regard to these specific issues uh, in the bilateral relationship and as they apply to how we engage each other at the WTO uh, or with broader proposals like the Zeroes proposal. Well, that sounds, uh, from all of you, like a, a, a very rich discussion. I'm re Scott's comments about the red, green, and yellow lights does remind me that when I began studying China, this will show my age, it was during the Cultural Revolution, and there was a time briefly uh, when the Red Guards were uh, in ascendance that they decreed that uh, red being the color of revolution, it could not possibly mean stop. Uh, at, at intersections, that red became the color, uh, red meant go, 
uh, and green had to mean stop. <laughs> After a large number of traffic accidents, I think they began to change their mind. So I'm not sure that the, uh, the analogy has the same meaning there but, and, and, uh, as it might here, but that was a long time ago. We'll, although, on the other hand, you could argue that uh, Xi Jinping is busy moving back in that direction in some respects, so we will see. Let me try to uh, extract some, uh, uh, not headlines, but uh, captions uh, from this and uh, maybe ask you guys to react and then ask you all to react as well. It seems to me that there are some principles that come through here uh, that have uh, broader utility, I think more in the first two groups than, than the third one, uh, which was the one I, where it sounds like there was most, uh, most visibly uh, a lack of consensus. Uh, but I would suggest they are uh, several things. One, big ideas have value. They may or not be attainable, uh, but they uh, are valuable as goal setting and as aspirational things that help motivate you and then help you develop a, a, a policy to implement them. A second and related, thinking outside the box has value. Uh, particularly what is the whole premise here that uh, is that you know the 21st century or this decade of the 21st century is not the same as the last century and we're dealing, like I said before, we're dealing with a world of global value chains which is a new thing. We're dealing with uh, the rise of not only China but other large economies that are going to be also uh, complicated for us, India being the most, uh, the most obvious. Uh, but, and we're all dealing with uh, a whole host of technological, technological changes. Digital trade is one I mentioned, but AI is one that's coming up, which is going to have a lot of uh, job implications uh, for everybody, not just uh, the United States. So the argument that, uh, that maybe you know, the institutions of, of 1944 uh, and the systems we developed uh, subsequent to that in the post-war era, uh, you know, may not really may not really be up to date and equipped to deal with a new set of challenges, and that we need to be willing to think outside that box uh, and look at uh, at uh, more creatively at other alternatives. That said, it seems to me that that the underlying argument that will emerge if you start talking about that, which I think underlines a lot of what all three groups said, is the question of uh, how important is national sovereignty uh, as an element of, of policy? Is it time, or is it past time, for countries to be more willing than they have been to cede some elements of sovereignty in the interest of having a collective agreement on how the system should operate? And you know, those of you that do this stuff know there's a lot of continuum uh, there. Uh, as uh, uh, Fred uh, Smith pointed out at, at dinner last night, one of the things that has been success successfully dealt with is sort of regulating air traffic and regulating you know, the signals you send and the rules you have for airports, landing strips. They all have numbered the same way. They all various numbers point the same way. So no matter where you are in the world, you can have a fairly high level of confidence that things are going to operate the same way in that when you're taking off or when you're landing. That's important. Uh, that's also a fairly benign example. Uh, one of the things that we're getting into, and, and I think um, Scott alluded to this when he talked about NTBs being the hardest part, is as tariffs go away, uh, well, <laughs> maybe they're not going away anymore, but as they used to be going away as the single most significant trade barrier, as we try to tackle other things, we do things that end, we get into issues that are much more intrusive mm -hmm. uh, in terms of people's daily lives. Because we start talking about health, safety, environmental standards, so we talk about what is your standard for seat belts. We talk about what is a labeling requirement on your food. We start talking about genetically modified organisms uh, and uh, geographical indications. Do you have to, you know, can you call it feta cheese if it's not from Greece, I guess? Or, or can you call it uh, Parmesan if it's not from Parma? Uh, these are issues that actually affect, you know, what people buy in, in the marketplace. And therefore, they become more sensitive than a slightly more uh, you know, abstract issue of whether your t-shirt is going to cost $9.99 or whether it's going to cost 
So as the trade system moves in that direction and the, and the issues become a little more complicated, uh, what we've seen coming up, particularly with the, this U.S. administration, is whether sovereignty, national sovereignty, is a paramount consideration or not. Uh, uh, this administration clearly believes it is. Ambassador Lighthizer clearly, clearly believes it is, and consistently has, has proposed uh, doing things. USMCA probably be the best example that uh, protect the sovereignty of the parties and remove, reduce, or eliminate. Uh, things that actually are in NAFTA that would subject the parties to independent tribunals or other decision-making processes that look more like arbitration uh, and, and neutral third-party arbitration and less like the countries making decisions. Um, that is partly based on your attitude of you know, how big and important we are uh, and whether we can assert ourselves. But it underlies a lot what I think was going on in a lot of Matt's discussion, um, if you fundamentally believe that national sovereignty is uh, uh, more relevant than it has ever been and is important national value for the U.S. to pursue, that determines how you're going to come out on the role of inter international institutions. You're going to, have one, you're going to want to have weaker institutions uh, and institutions with, uh, that have more opportunities for derogation. Uh, if you think that the world is moving in a direction that uh, uh, it's harder and harder for countries to exercise their sovereignty and get away with it, then you're going to be more interested in building institutions, either rebuilding the current ones or building new ones that, that are stronger. I think that was an unresolved question, but you have to kind of deal with the sovereignty question uh, first. And then related to that, and these things are all related, and this gets into what Scott was saying, is a new issue that is coming up as I think he put it in, in terms of trade uh, as strategic competition, which also means the role of, of security and national security in trade. And the analogy that strikes me is, uh, which, which Scott didn't mention, is the difference in uh, how we dealt with Japan in the 80s and early 90s and how we're dealing with China now. Some of the things that the Japanese were doing on trade in the 80s are very similar to what the Chinese are doing on trade right now. Not all of them, but a lot of them. But the larger relationship between the countries was very different. Japan was not regarded as a strategic competitor. It was not regarded as an adversary. It was regarded as an ally. And you know, in the 80s, probably an annoying one that caused a lot of political difficulties here and caused a lot of consternation in selected sectors, beginning with autos and semiconductors. But nonetheless, you know, they weren't the enemy. Uh, they were a problem we had to deal with. Uh, the Chinese relationship is different. You know, they're not an ally. And we could have a long, we could spend two more hours on, yes, you know, stop. whether they're an existential threat or an adversary or a pain in the neck. But we don't need to, to do that. But the relationship is different, even though some of the problems are the same. <laughs> and so that has added a complexity to trying to solve that problem that we have not always had uh, in other cases. And I don't, think we have a, I don't think we answered that question. I mean, I think we're still uh, working through that. But clearly, right now, <laughs> underlying the issues that we have with China <laughs> is the fact that if you look at a lot of them, they are in, a lot of them are in the ICT sector or in uh, critical technology sectors that do have security implications, that have direct military implications. And if you think about what both sides tend to be saying, uh, not always to each other, but sometimes privately, is both of them look on these things as security issues and not just as trade issues. For the Chinese, you know, access to data, control of the internet, uh, you know, limitations on digital trade are not just about protection and it's not just about their companies. It's about their ability to achieve a variety of national security objectives and internal public control objectives that go beyond simply commerce. And likewise here, a significant part of the technology transfer debate is not just economic, you know, we're giving them competitive tools it's we're giving them competitive tools that also have military application that may at some future point come back and bite us. Um, so that debate has gotten 
uh, a lot more complicated as well. Um, and it's one that's going to make it more difficult to sort through because it's, you know, when you're talking about uh, at the other extreme, when you're talking about tariffs, uh, these are problems that for the most part could be solved. Mm -hmm. You know, you say it should be 10%, I should say it, say it should be zero. After a very long conversation, we can probably come up with the, some number that's in between because we're talking about numbers. Uh, when you're talking about other stuff, uh, particularly about national security, it's a lot more complicated. And uh, I'm not sure there are lessons here for that, but it clearly, I think, is something that we're going to have to pay a lot more attention to going forward. It's what the Firma debate was about that mm -hmm. uh, I think several of you actually got into one way or the other, and Secretary Paulson commented us on as well. Uh, and that relates to both inbound investment as well as to outbound investment and the export control issues that the Secretary mentioned as well. So those are kind of the themes that I get out of this, which really means is more you know, a work pro program for going forward than a solution to all the problems. But that, in fact, is what we were looking for. You guys got any comments on any of that? Sure. Uh, maybe we'll go this way from narrowest to, to broadest. Um, in my typical forlorn uh, mood, I, I've been thinking about what are, what are ways for me to think more positively. And, and think big ideas are certainly one way. I've more recently thinking about accidents of history. Uh, what if in the summer of 2008 in the green room things had gone a little bit differently and we had ended up with a Doha deal, right? That's, you know, perhaps a crazy thought. Uh, what if Edward Snowden decided to, instead of be a defense contractor, he went surfing? You know, uh, what if Chinese politics turned out differently? What if you mean surfing in the ocean? In the ocean, <laughs> not on the yes, internet. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Um, you're smarter than I'm. Just running into a bunch of mistakes. You know, we had we've had presidents have had walks in the woods. Maybe they'll have a walk on the beach, or along a river in the next couple of days. Uh, but I don't think really we need to. We should depend on accidents. Um, first, uh, I think China's state capitalist system is pretty hardwired. Uh, Xi Jinping has turned up the volume, but he didn't come in and fundamentally change the system from something that it wasn't. Uh, and so we're going to have to live with that system, uh, unless for some reason they, they go the way of the dodo bird, and I don't, I don't think China's disappearing. In addition, our system is kind of hardwired hard too. We've got um, you know, in, uh, interest group politics, uh, more polarization, uh, and we've got institutions that don't function very well. So I think those kind of things are basically hardwired into our bilateral relationship and may affect these bigger issues. Um, and I definitely am for big ideas. Of course, the Chinese have big ideas too. Uh, they don't speak out loudly right. about them, but Xi Jinping actually is speaking more loudly about them, and not just in China, but elsewhere. And so I think it's really, really important that we speak with clarity about our big ideas, advocate, push for them, because we are competing with other big ideas. And so. Uh, although I think a, part, a job of a think tank is to be practical and manage problems and push the ball slowly up the hill, we need to push big ideas because we know that the others are going to be pushing big ideas too. You guys want to, Matt, you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, I, um, uh, I, I would say first of all, you know, your point about um, we need to think outside the box and, and recognize, you know, we're not in 1944 anymore. I, definitely in our group, that was a clear view that nobody was defending the status quo. I think everybody thought there's something wrong and that we need to rethink and do things to very differently. I mean, at a structural level as well as at, in terms of kind of dealing with some specific issues that are different from the past. And so, so that, was, that was pretty clear and I think appropriate. Though, I guess, and now I'm adding a little editorial uh, opinion of my own, I, I would say the, the thing about 1944 that was important, and I say this sometimes to my Chinese um, colleagues when we have discussions about the global economic order, is that, you know, and this is a little oversimplified, but, you know, those countries, the 44 countries that sat down at Bretton Woods, you know, started with a set of problems, and, you know, two big ones in particular, you know, that we had been for 30 years shooting at each other and, you know, devaluing our currencies into perdition and, you know, using protectionism and so forth. And we needed to stop doing that and we needed to have institutions and rules and norms that would prevent those problems um, recurring. And, and, and so, the, but it sort of went, it flowed in that order. We started with what's the problem, 
um, where do we agree and disagree on you know, what the nature of the problem is, and then what are the specific solutions to bring to those problems, um, and where can we agree and disagree? And there's probably less agreement on the solutions than on the, the definition of the problem, um, but, and then what, then what institutions and rules do we need to, to govern all of that? And I think that was, broadly speaking, the kind of the, the stream of thought process. And what troubles me in some of the debate today is that the, the debate seems to start with the institutions and something's wrong with the seating order or with the, you know, with the functioning of some process or something. Um, and we're not focusing, we're not starting with looking at what's the problem we're trying to solve. And so, again, I'm editorializing. This was not really discussed explicitly, at least in our group, but I think that's an important part of the way we need to think about this and the U.S. needs to think about it. On your point about sovereignty, I think that definitely, as I said, did come up in our group and we had a, you know, we raised hands and I think most people, including Derek, raised their hand to say the basic deal of tying your own hands in order to get the other guy to tie his hands um, is, is still basically a good, is the right approach uh, for us because nobody wants chaos. Um, we need some sort of order. We need, um, we can't have everybody just going out and doing things their own way. Um, even, you know, Derek was not advocating that. Um, but I think was advocating for our starting with our interests and deciding what our own uh, interests were, what our own uh, um, preferences were. And uh, on, as I mentioned, things like intellectual property, on things like FIRMA, um, and then taking that out into the arena and, and, and making the case for that that approach, um, and so um, I think that was, and, and several other speakers also made the point about, you know, really focusing on getting our own house in order, investing in our own um, debates and decisions about these things, and of course in the, in the actual infrastructure and literal and figuratively of our domestic economy, you know, before going out into these battles. Um, but that's a different thing from, you know, focusing primarily on that or first and foremost on that is consistent with then going out and being willing to trade uh, some of your sovereignty in order to get everybody else to be constrained by this, uh, this system, you know, along your lines. Um, and there was one other thing I was going to say, but I've forgotten, so I'll pass on to Scott. Scott. So one quick, quick comment. Look, uh, I've been doing it for a while, but I wish the rules-based system was not so doggone difficult to defend. Uh, you know, it's just, <laughs> when you look at the WTO, particularly over the last dozen or so years, all I, all I hear in my head is the, is the commercial, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. And it, it, it looks, it, it, it's, it, it's fallen in a state of disrespect as well as ineffectiveness. And I, I frankly worry about that. I worry about that because I, you know, I know enough about human nature to know that a set of rules which are developed by mutual agreement and enforced by mutual consent is a superior way of human interaction th than the alternative. And uh, so perhaps as a, as a starting point, uh, before, before getting into a discussion on sovereignty or anything else, you gotta get a discussion of how this has been a peace project. Uh, and uh, it, it's easy to forget that New York is New York and not New Amsterdam because of a shooting war over nutmeg, all right? And so uh, we're capable of that. <laughs> and so I think at some point, Maybe the institution will earn its respect back, but there ought to be a way for us to help create more respect for what's been done, lest we ignore, ignore it and lose it, so. Okay, let's turn, out, turn to um, you all. If anybody wants to make a, a either ask a question or make a con con concluding uh, <laughs> comment, Fair warning, I may ask uh, our inspiration for this whole thing, Mr. Smith, to see if he wants to make, say anything at the end. You could have time to think about it, uh, and if you don't, that's fine too. Uh, other people have any comments, questions you want to make? Do you disagree with anything that uh, uh, the, the summary of uh, the discussion? No, I can't see it. There's a, uh, I think nobody has anything. It's well, what a disappointment. We've persuaded we, them. We've we, we uh, yeah, you time for you're all brave, yes. Fred, do you want to make any concluding comment or, or not? Well, I would just say... Uh, it's a microphone. Uh, Mike. Have a Mike. I think that one of the biggest problems we have uh, is this disconnect between the benefits of trade and the political rhetoric about it. Mm -hmm. So we sponsored a couple of years ago, you can look it up, uh, a movie called uh, Living in the Age of Airplanes. 
and it was about how humans had basically been able to move at the speed of a horse for the whole entire history of the humankind until the 19th century. Then we got to go the fast as a steam train. And now we get on an airplane and go from Los Angeles to Sydney, Australia in you know 12 hours or whatever the case may be, sitting in the airplane watching a movie or playing a video game. And people are sitting there saying, God, this thing is two hours late. I mean, I can't get it. <laughs> Where 100 years ago, it took you several months to get from Los Angeles to, to Australia. Mm -hmm. So in this film, you go forward in it, and it goes to this house, and it follows a FedEx plane taking flowers around. And it goes into a house. And then it starts showing everything in that house that comes from every part of the mm -hmm. globe. So the citizens of the country have an incredible standard of living yes. because of trade, but somehow it's disconnected from all of this <coughs> rhetoric of, of trade is bad and nationalism and so forth. So I think that's the fundamental issue, including the, the demonization of the, of the multi-party uh, processes that were set up after World War II and uh, it's better than the alternative. And, and that's where we're failing, is getting those messages across. Well, I have to say, just as uh, thank you for that. That brings us back to the beginning and why this is important. I can't resist noting that if you saw the Washington Post this morning, <coughs> despite the digital age and the age of air travel, Kim Jong-un took the train to Hanoi. Mm. <laughs> um, 60 hours, averaging 35 miles an hour. Uh, a trip he could have made by plane in what? Eight, maybe? Six? I don't know. So not everybody is in the, uh, <laughs> is in the, the 21st century. But uh, in any event, I think that's a fitting message to, to conclude on. Most of the people in this room who are professionally in this business would say that we have not done a particularly good job of getting people to see the benefits of, of, of trade. Uh, and you're quite right. You go to your house and you don't think about it uh, because all these things uh, are there that everyone sort of takes for granted and you don't think about uh, the, and, and the, the video, uh, I, I think, portrayed this very well about the nature of global supply chains that brings thing in, things that, in that you couldn't do, bef uh, do before. Uh, when I was on the Hill, I used to give a speech about this and would point out that uh, you know, then 50 now, and more than 60% of the country's cut flowers uh, are imported. They come from Colombia or Israel or the Netherlands. I mean, they from across oceans. And I was speaking at one point to the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern North Carolina, which doesn't have a lot of big cities, but somebody came up to me afterwards from there and said, you know that story about the flowers? I said, that's nothing. That's nothing. We got a company, uh, we got a, a bunch of uh, fishermen off the coast who catch uh, flounder, and they ship it to the Tokyo fish market every day, fresh. This was 20 years ago, yeah. 25 years ago. Uh, this is impossible to even conceive of 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the world is moving with much greater speed, and now, uh, you know, you're right, people complain about it's too long. I mean, talk to people, uh, talk to students, you know, who uh, have uh, Skype and uh, laptops and can basically tune in all over the world and try to tell them what, uh, you know, what, what phones, ordinary phones are like. There's a hilarious video that some of you may have seen of teenagers uh, trying to figure out how to use a dial phone, you know, and they, they don't understand that you have to pick up the receiver first. <laughs> before yes. before yeah, anything so, happens, yeah. and they kept they figured out the numbers, and they'd be dialing the numbers, and then nothing would happen. They couldn't understand why. And I'm thinking, you know, when you reach a certain age, this becomes sort of absurd. But uh, that illustrates several things. One, the speed of change uh, is a challenge for all of us to keep up with. It's a challenge for our institutions to keep up with, yes. and it's a it's arguable. I, I think clearly in in this group feeling that maybe our institutions haven't done that. Uh, it's a challenge for us uh, to keep up with uh, the change as well. And it's also a challenge, I think, for people that are in this business uh, to defend the benefits that accrue from the change. Uh, 
because otherwise uh, people are just going to focus on the costs uh, and, and the inconveniences because the you know the the fundamental rule of, of trade is that the the costs tend to be short term and specific and the long the benefits tend to be longer term and more diffuse and uh, there's a constant battle to try to get people to keep them in balance the person that I referred to earlier who said there's all this stuff you didn't talk about uh, the example he used was inequality and which is one of the consequences and that's an issue that we don't have time to talk about today and we didn't set it up but it's an issue that we'll come back to because it underlies a lot of the domestic debate uh, here actually and in other countries about trade so with that um, let me thank you all out there in the audience for your participation thank you for coming thank you for participating in the uh, in the breakout sessions and for saying what you said and for providing a rich basis for debate Thank you to uh, our discussants, Ambassador Schwab, who's here, Kathy, who was here, but I think uh, maybe uh, is not anymore, um, Dan, who I think may or may not be here, David and Derek, I know, who had to leave, and uh, Jorge, uh, and also to our three moderators for uh, a superb job of trying to pull all this together. And we're concluded. Thank you. Thank you.